This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. Esoteric Hollywood is where I deconstruct the biggest films in an unparalleled way, from the classics of the silver screen to today's blockbusters. Learn to watch film with new eyes as we enter Esoteric Hollywood. Welcome to another episode of Jay's Analysis. This time we're going to be looking at the first half or so of Servando Gonzalez's book, Psychological Warfare and the New World Order. And I mentioned this, you know, on the last few podcasts, and I thought it would be good to go ahead and do a discussion on the book. And I'm going to put a link to where you can get his book. You can also, of course, still purchase my book, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. I still have a limited number of copies that I can sell and you can just message me directly for that uh, through uh, my email uh, or at Jay's Analysis or Facebook or Twitter and it'll be $30 and you can do that as I said through check or PayPal and everybody's loving it I want to thank all the people that have bought it thank all the supporters a lot of people have bought um, you know signed copies and it's been really cool I got some uh, author signings that'll be coming up and <clears throat> I do have a little bit of a cold still so forgive my my voice my gravelly sound here but maybe the babes will still like my voice maybe if I get really sick I'll have very white voice and uh, can't get enough of your love baby so the first thing we want to talk about with Servando's book and why I've included it is because it's a very excellent addendum to Tragedy and Hope. And of course Servando's book will cite Tragedy and Hope uh, in several places. And what it is is kind of a deep state intelligence analysis of how the CFR and the CIA work and how they run the country and control the media. and the exemplar boogeyman the, the the bad man that's put out there in this case is the character of uh, Fidel Castro so the whole book's not Castro the first chunk of the book is about the history of the CFR and the CIA and then we move to Castro later on and uh, this is of course kind of the, <clears throat> the field that Servando focuses on in his research is, is Castro and Agent Castro as he calls them. And Now the reason this is important is because when you go to mainstream media and especially given the recent death of uh, the leader of the Revolution, Fidel, you'll get two views. They're, right? It's a polarizing bifurcation when it comes to the character of Fidel and that on the one hand is he is a communist tyrant you know he's a total uh, lib uh, the liberal tyrant that we're told in the media uh, in the in the US for these last several decades the other view is this more sort of international view that oh he was actually a man of the people and you know all of that other view is right wing smear campaign by the the corporatists and the imperialists and uh, like many revolutionary leaders before him Che and Fidel and Chavez and many of these other persons in Latin America uh, no they're the real deal and that's why America hates them but as we know most things in history and in politics and in geopolitics and philosophy and whatever they're not that simple and easily packaged into a bifurcation right of uh, this guy is the the great uh, Satan <laughs> if you read the uh, Breitbart or something like this versus uh, well, oh he's the great hero right if you were to read I don't know the inter the Socialist Worker Party magazine or something like this I don't know but what do they even like him I don't know he's a controversial character and not all the liberals and leftists and uh, communists like him either which is interesting and that's going to play into partly the analysis uh, of Servando. Now, as I said, the, the book begins with 
Servando giving us his, and I, I, I do intend to try to get Servando on, so this is not a replacement for buying and reading the book. This is just an analysis and overview, and we're not just going to be talking about his book. We're also going to be looking at uh, other topics dealing with uh, the CFR and with Castro and so on. Um, excuse me, with uh, PSYOPs and conspiracy theory, quote-unquote, and many of the things that you've heard me say already, especially from the Tragedy and Hope talks, they're expanded upon. Uh, by Servando, so there's not, it's it's not uh, mere repetition. It's not the same stuff over and over and over. We're actually going to be uh, looking at new uh, information that you're not going to find anywhere else, and that's why the book is so good. And I I, I, min I mentioned this I think in the last concluding uh, tragedy and hope talk. So here and we're going to point out this uh, very crucial approach to analysis that Servando says is that you have to understand that for a lot of Western media and print media the CIA is able to not always necessarily completely control it but to censor and to spin it right now we've seen this very clearly with the the uh, WikiLeaks and Clinton campaign coordination and I think there's a very definite tie between the Clinton establishment the Bush establishment and the CIA right now, conspiracy theory, he notes, of course, is this sort of meaningless pejorative term invented by the CIA to associate the term with immediate discreditation, right? You're immediately discredited because the, the label has been somehow associated in the mass mind with kook and crazy, right? Now, we know that that's not no longer really working anymore because conspiracy theory, quote unquote, is so popular especially in the YouTubes. So what I thought was really good is Servando points out that there's a lot of left gatekeepers who are the supposed uh, freedom fighters and champions. And what better example than Noam Chomsky and the guy who calls me a blathering idiot on YouTube videos for not reading Chomsky because Chomsky has the real answer. Well, actually, uh, dude, you should go read Servando because he deconstructs Chomsky. Now, I did study language and semiotics in college and grad school, so I'm not new to Chomsky. I'm aware of his nominalist, pragmatic approach to language, which is utterly retarded. Uh, but the real story about Chomsky, of course, is that he is a gatekeeper for the left. He will not talk about 9-11. He believes the official story of 9-11. And in fact, in the last election, he actually said that Hillary was uh, the ideal, or the, excuse me, the best candidate. So, Chomsky out shilling for Hillary. Shillery, right? Chomsky shillery. So don't give me this nonsense, right, of uh, the idea that, oh, it's all this right-wing conspiracy. And that's the nonsense of Hillary Clinton, right? Vast right-wing conspiracy. No, if you look at the history of Marxism, and this is what Servando begins the book saying, is that you're really going to find big foundations in the background, and that's what none of the left gatekeepers will ever talk about. They're, they'll never tell you the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, are behind their world revolution. And he also says, importantly, that uh, he likens the, the approach of, of the establishment, <clears throat> Servando does, to sorcery. And now he talks about how black magic and sorcery are this tool of setting aside the spiritual reality of it but they're they're this tool for duping you and tricking you uh, and that's what the magical effect is and that's what the mainstream media does then he talks about how given the CIA's uh, vast control of printing and the press in the US and suppression over the last several decades you have to understand that they lie right so you can't just believe uh, you know the CIA's book that comes out on JFK or Castro or whatever it might be because they're keen purveyors and profferers of disinformation. So blank acceptance even of quote leaks is foolish uh, and naive in this realm of study and this, that's a, something that Jay's analysis has pointed out for the last several years especially in relationship to Snowden or WikiLeaks and you can see my last uh, few videos where I, I go into that in some depth now <clears throat> how to do true analysis 
according to Servando, is is dealt with, as we said in this introduction, very well. And so he talks about that you you want to examine and verify the sources first of all uh, for the information. You also want to, as best you can, try to figure out motivations. In other words, if there's a quote leak, rather than accepting the leak at face value, you might want to consider who are the leaks targeted at, who is omitted from this leak. Does this leak benefit the foreign policy of the United States or the Pentagon? Uh, does it benefit some private entity or business? Does it benefit some political party? Right. So you, you can't just bare face, bold face, say, oh, it's a leak. The guy's a hero. He also talks about <clears throat> targeted leaks uh, being a means of, uh, you know, tarnishing people's names or, or, or altering mass opinion. And he talks about the art of deception. Another key point that he makes is that when you look at the history of operations like this, Bay of Pigs or whatever, or Castro and this stuff, and this will apply by extension, listeners, I want you to understand this, and this is an approach that I've taken to other boogeymen, Bin Laden, right, North Korea. These are the boogeymen that we need to, to pay attention to. In a, because in those cases, I think there's hard evidence to show that something l ludicrous and loony is afoot, especially with North Korea. <laughs> now, the art of deception is part of tradecraft. Tradecraft is the what spies study, right? And it's all about keeping people in the dark and giving you disinformation or distractions or red herrings. That's how this whole thing works. And one of the key points to how the CIA accomplishes this is to reverse what is often considered a failure as a success and what is often considered a success turn it into a failure. Now you might say on the surface, that's counterintuitive, why would you do that? Well, for one, a quote failure can achieve a lot of alternative ends that might be more lucrative or beneficial to what you want to achieve in the long run. So for example, uh, we might have a an intelligence failure, quote unquote, that leads to the justification for large scale foreign operations, i.e. 9-11, uh, that leads to large scale increases in funding, right? Terrorism, quote unquote, 9 11, etc. Uh, that leads to numerous other, uh, the alteration of the, of the, uh, the American landscape, uh, right? To a new phase, 9 11, where all these things out of the, the so called failure of intelligence actually have benefited this to the establishment tremendously. And Servando says that that's not new with 9 11. This is something that is a pattern and a, and a trend going all the way back so he talks about the u-2 spy planes over cuba and what have we seen in the history of people dealing with this story and and, and analyzing it bare bold face blank acceptance of the so-called data and what is the so-called data satellite images of nukes now is that even true well we don't know because it was just assumed to be to be the case and so what servando says is that it's actually this is actually foolish right he says quote from the standpoint of the view of intelligence and espionage only information that has been secretly from the enemy could be considered bona fide but if it is found out that the opposition has voluntarily turned it over it automatically becomes suspect of being disinfo uh, this is a principle that automa automatically makes all books based on information provided by the cia suspicious and likely disinfo this is also why we can't just trust these so-called defectors like Anatoly Galitzin or somebody like this who goes to the CIA and then all oh, the CIA backs his, his book that comes out as he defects because it's going to be directly from James Jesus Angleton's deception mill uh, in that case. So in the same way, we have to have that same approach, rational approach, that controlled approach, that sustained analytical approach and considering of, of means of method of motivation right behind all of the possible real reasons uh, for a leak uh, or a expose book or a disinformation operation or a limited hangout or a whatever it might be 
uh, and it also doesn't mean right I know it's not it would be nice if it was if it was super simple but it also doesn't mean that everything that might come out of the leak is fake I, I believe that the emails obviously in the WikiLeaks case uh, are real now the motivations as to why and, and the timing of this leak uh, we already know, according to Pachenik, that uh, you know it was done in coordination with WikiLeaks by members of the deep state. Uh, now, do we actually know the full reasons and ramifications for why that is? You know, who, I'm sure somebody knows, but uh, I don't think we know exactly yet. We'll have to wait and see what you know what happens in the in the Trump administration as it actually comes to power when he takes office. Yeah, I think we'll get to see what the deep state might have been planning uh, or a faction or whatever 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 the true scenario is uh certainly we hope that uh, somebody would go after the clinton foundation and uh this you know awful nastiness that looks to be looks to be real but we'll I'll just have to wait and see in that in that regard but suffice to say that that the strategies and techniques of the cia are really under the umbrella of their parent corporation a rival secret society corporate private intelligence network known as the CFR now just to kind of hammer home the point that I've made for a while about North Korea is that you'll even see this kind of pop up here and there in mainstream news and we've talked about this as I said in the last two videos but look here's NBC News admitting and this was all over the news back in 2013 I remember it a big hoax experts say the North Korea is showing off missiles that can't fly <laughs> now the response I've heard from people who try to defend that North Korea has the nukes is that oh uh, it's always been sort of procedural process it's just the norms of procedure that you don't actually roll out your uh, your what do you call them nukes or whatever in the midst of a parade and so this was supposed to be paraded through the streets of Pyongyang and what do we see well it's fake now if that were the only instance of fakery in relationship to North Korea I might buy that but it's not as you can see in the article that I did before uh, North Korea fake space program the article that I've mentioned many times that I did a few years ago if you go back and read that article you'll see that basically everything around North Korea in terms of what we see in the news media is fake and they admit here the Rand guy Rand guy from the Rand Corporation my opinion is that it's a big hoax Marcus Shiler says from the for, a former Rand Corporation military analyst and so we're supposed to believe according to even still mainstream media that nukes are just constantly being built up and sold and transferred to North Korea and oh they might nuke us any moment but what does NBC new even the mainstream media says well all that we've seen in regard to North Korean nukes is fake now if this can be fake then so can their so-called space program be fake and I think that my article on that shows it to be fake and then you can also read uh, veteran analyst F. William Ingdahl's analysis uh, on North Korea being a Pentagon vassal state. Now that's a different issue but it relates because what have we seen with the nuke story is the U-2 missile crisis uh, right for Cuba. We uh oh the U-2 uh, spy planes have seen <laughs> the nukes in Cuba. Um and uh, Servando deals with this on uh, page 17. Now, again, keep that in mind as we move through the first chapter and few chapters of Servando's book, uh, because it's going to tie in directly to a lot of the information that I'm going to present in the next few scenes of this uh, this clip. Now, if you go and look at the article I did last year it's called isis feminists and thugs dupes of the foundations and think tanks it's when i try to really get into the the topic of color revolutions and how that's the new technology a technique of achieving regime change and you can also find a good interview that i did with uh, andrew karibko and 
I read Andrew's book and his uh, ebook is online. You can get that specifically on this technique of asymmetrical warfare and color revolutions and how it all ties into hashtags. And this is how they achieve the destabilizations and regime changes and you know the, the new business phases of the new world order, so to speak, in other countries. And now, why are we talking about this in relationship to Servando's book? Well, because Servando points out something really uh, important that other books don't talk about. And he's even highlighted that this is covered up for a reason. And what is that? Well, it's, it's the Bogotazo riots. Now, why are we talking about that? Well, this is the regime change operation that was one of the first attempts at what we might call a, a CIA coup. And it's this is in Colombia. And we go back to 1948, and this is where they, they the nascent CIA, uh, or OSS, right, had wanted to get rid of this uh, uh, Gaitan, the, elect, the elected leader of Colombia, who wanted to, of course, nationalize the resources and so forth. And that always brings forth the, the CIA coup now, doesn't it? And y'all always hear that, oh, Iran was the first uh, successful attempt, attempt at this, and they got rid of uh, Mossadegh. And then in 1954, they got rid of uh, President Arbenz in Guatemala. But what he says is that they never talk about the Bogotazo riots in 1948 because this was the first attempt at this and that it most likely appears to have involved Castro as one of the provocateurs. The very young Castro, I believe he was 21 at the time, according to Servando. And what Servando says, and we'll get into more of this in a little bit, but he says what none of the CIA books mention is that the Bogotazo actually was the CIA's first successful large-scale PSYOP operation carried out on behalf of the CFR. In it, they tested the new covert warfare, and this is what will eventually be the technology of the color revolution, the propaganda and the mind control techniques later employed in all the operations, right, from JFK to 9-11, and that's absolutely true. That's exactly what they did, and what's amazing, and I think what most people don't understand uh, now I know that a lot of you who listen to you know the work that I do and other researchers that that you know feature my work and do good work, we'll already know that we kind of get the idea that it's a technology that's been scientifically perfected, but this is still lost on a lot of people, right? They don't understand that the media and psyops go hand in hand, and they've been studied, as I said, scientifically to be able to craft and and move the populations in various countries into whatever direction they need to be moved into. And as Mr. Green from Quantum of Solace says to James Bond, Mr. Bond, you should know that the people I work with will work with the left or the right dictators or revolutionaries. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, that's the good line from <clears throat> the Spectre member, Mr. Green, in Quantum of Solace. Exactly. So, <clears throat> Now, when we look at the CFR, this is a good example of this kind of front face of Spectre, actually. Absolutely. So you want to know where Spectre is, what it is? Well, you need to look no further than the CFR. Now, the CFR is not necessarily, you know, every single wealthy elite person. The CFR is a little more media focused. They have a lot to do with persons in media, journalists, so-called uh, right, the, the frontispiece of media at the top of the pyramid. Right now, obviously, there are people in the CFR or above the CFR, namely the people who created the CFR, such as <clears throat> you know the kind of the Rockefeller types, the Brzezinski types, the Kissinger types. The, these people are have a little more <clears throat> power and weight, uh, especially Kissinger has more weight <laughs> than than your normal CFR person like you know, Angelina Jolie or Clooney or somebody like this, uh, because they've been at this for a long time. And, and they're obviously a lot more adept at geopolitics than Angelina Jolie would be. Right. I mean, obviously Henry Kissinger's, he was, he was involved in regime changes before Angelina Jolie was around. So 
the <clears throat> CFR, of course, also has been around for a lot longer than even persons like Kissinger. So the next part that we're going to get into in Servando's book deals with this group called the Inquiry. So let's look at who that is and how this ties into intelligence. If we come over to the CFR page, under the history of the CFR, we find the foreword by Leslie Gelb that speaks of the inquiry. And this is hitting on the point that I'm making, and we're going to see that, you know, this is even on Wikipedia too, so it's not like this is hidden information, it's public. And he says, it happens very seldom indeed that novel and sensible ideas spring forth from the never-ending discourse about U.S. foreign policy. But without all the palaver, such ideas would rarely have a chance to breathe. Since 1921, the CFR has been the privileged and print, print, PR, present. I don't think they need a editor here at the CFR. <laughs> print non-governmental impresario of America's pageant, exactly America's pageant, to find its place in the world. For 75 years, council members have talked and listened to each other and to outsiders along the way. They have enjoyed catalyzing instances of insight, lucidity, blah, blah. I'm going to skip this flowery language here. Uh, Peter Gross chronicles many of these high and low points uh, in uh, Foreign Affairs, the Steam Journal, and he's going to go back to the, let's see, <clears throat> if the council <clears throat> as a body has stood for anything for 75 years, he, go, he says that it goes back to Pratt House, right? This is the sort of the model of the CFR based on its uh, Royal Society and roundtable groups out of England. And the New York division, of course, is Pratt House. And he says that the council's had its influence during this period. And it's titled The Inquiry, right? According to this article. Now, what is inquiry? So we go over here to we look at the Wikipedia page and you're gonna see that the inquiry is a study group established in 1917 by Woodrow Wilson and it prepares materials and peace negotiations and part of World War one it was 150 academics exactly and so who is the real body of the CIA well we saw with MK Ultra that CIA was a lot of these psychiatrists and so-called you know, psychologists and pseudo scientists, doctors, quote unquote, who were really just sickos. And in the same way, the so called intelligence experts are really just these academics. And if you listen to Jay's, Jay's analysis very frequently, you know that I can't stand academics. These are the most uh, scumbag people on the planet. Uh, and so Woodrow Wilson sets this up and who was involved in that well none other than Edwin Mandel House our good old friend who was uh, the handler for Whit Wilson and behind the erection of the Federal Reserve Bank they were directly supervised by philosopher hmm philosopher huh Sidney Mezzies heads of the research were Walter Lippmann the ad man who would go into the CIA and who was later replaced by Isaiah Bowman. The group first worked out of the New York Public Library. Uh, and they had offices titled American Geographical Society. Uh, isn't that in one of the spy fiction shows, if I recall? There's like a front where it's like the Geographical Society, but they're actually a bunch of spies. I can't remember. But anyway, I mentioned some other characters here, but 21 members of the inquiry were later integrated into the larger American Commission to negotiate peace and the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 following World War One, of course. And we know that, according to Quigley, that was all divvied up by the bankers. The bankers were who were, who were at Paris and Potsdam and all these conferences to uh, cut up the globe according to the banker interests and the bankers were who were behind the wars, according to Quigley. So... This is where Columbia University begins to take its role in CIA intelligence stuff. And this is, you know, where, well, who comes out of Columbia? Doesn't uh, Brzezinski still lecture there? You know, total CIA school. Specializing in, uh, you know, basically geopolitics is what this is, inquiry is all about. But it's not 
analysis of geopolitics, there are a bunch of agents of the bankers who are spies. Some members would later establish the Council on Foreign Relations, which is, quote, independent of the government. Oh, yeah, right. That's why all of these people are a revolving door who go in and out of government. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, oh, yeah, he's yeah he's totally independent of the government. Uh, yeah, right. Henry Kissinger, oh, yeah, totally independent. So that is the, the incubator from which the OSS will be born. All right, so you get the inquiry, and this becomes OSS, and this becomes CIA, and that's really the whole the whole background to uh, where we get this, what Servando calls conspirators' plot to control the U.S. And that is accurate; it is a conspirators' plot. You can debate what date exactly. You know, they had full control. Maybe it was it was before 1913. You know, Quigley says that by 1900, uh, you know, the the top oligarch families already owned over half the country so you could argue that they had control of the United States far before that uh, maybe even uh, the American Revolution itself uh, we, we know it was funded by foreign powers right France uh, even Russia aided in uh, helping the American Revolution so you know it gets kind of fuzzy when we try to go back into history and again figure out who the bad guy, good guys and bad guys were because there's not really good guys and bad guys in geopolitics generally speaking all right now i mean obviously there are aggressors and non-aggressors and things like this and i do believe that you can speak of some places countries nations as worse or more wicked than others uh, you know the bible speaks that way pretty frequently but generally speaking you know we're looking at what's the main point of all this the meat of this the meat of this that the inquiry is this cabal uh, they are the academics. Keep that in mind. It's these academics that are the real spies, the real invisible government here. And that's where we will get the OSS and the CIA. Now, keep in mind, as I wrote back in my article from 2013, the Western Support for Communism, CFR, OSS, Soviets in Asia, I showed you how the ideas that are supposedly out of conspiracy circles uh, is really a question of full spectrum dominance in the Anglo-American great game model and what I talked about there was again this history of the CFR based on the Oxford Roundtable groups and the Royal Institute for International Affairs and then the Pratt House with its uh, British counterpart Chatham House right and what you get is the CFR on its own site once again we can go look at that once again uh, stating that the council's home was on East 65th Street and then John D. Rockefeller led a slate of 200 members of companies who volunteered to fund the covert and gracious residences into office of meeting rooms and so forth, right? This private entity that is going to be a supra-governmental entity, the background shadow government. And I talk about how this went into the Cold War and you had a lot of these figures and the, the, these bankers in the background really wanting to reorganize other countries like Russia uh, with the Cold War, the Baltic states, and then it's going to expand into Latin America. So what we looked at in my article that dealt with OSS operations in China with Bill Donovan, you're going to get the same model, okay, not just in Asia or Southeast Asia. Uh, or the Middle East, uh, right? This is Mark Curtis's book, all this Cold War stuff in the Middle East. Miles Copeland, Game of Nations, Middle East. If we look at Servando's book, we're going to be looking at Latin America. Okay, now Quigley talked about that. He talked about the uh, Alliance for Progress, this uh, JFK sort of NGO thing to alter the landscape of Latin America and a lot of people again are, are falling into or South Central South America as well a lot of people fall into this mistake of thinking that all the operations there were just right-wing conservative quote-unquote versus the Soviet communists and that's not exactly true and that's the big key to get here is to understand that the game is a little bit deeper than that it's not simple binary bifurcations like we all have been told growing up about how it is there now does that mean again 
it doesn't mean the, the commies are the good guys, and it doesn't mean that the good guys are the right-wing death squads. Not, neither of these is true. It's both sides of this being manipulated at a higher level while you have all of the real things playing out. You really have revolutions. You really have coups. You really have you know, these dictators being toppled, whether right-wing or left-wing. Right? Arbenz or Guatemala or Peron, all these different persons who uh, come to power and then lose power. It's no different than what we've seen in the last several decades with Saddam, Hamid Karzai, and you know he says is the CIA runs the drugs in Afghanistan. Hamid Karzai says that. President of Afghanistan, right? It's no different. So just understand that the technique of the regime change, the coup, the color revolution, and all that, was already planned out long ago and it didn't begin with the Shah in Iran uh, for the CFR CIA it was actually going on you know, in 1948 when the group was you know first sort of coalescing now the inquiry was involved in World War One and who knows what they were up to and their shenanigans back then you know we saw Quigley dealing with some of that uh, but when we look at Servando's chapter, which is really good, the first chapter be beginning, well, the first chapter that deals with uh, the inquiry. What does he say their plan was? Well, their plan was, number one, free trade. Remove all economic barriers. Exactly. To have global government, you got to have global trade. And how long have I been talking about this and how stupid are the libertarians that just continue to tout this without ever thinking about the fact that all your globalist New World Order leaders the ones who have touted free trade and that's also why Marx was a fan of free trade because he thought it would aid in bringing global government and you can read actual quotes quotes from Marx where he said that I brought it up in articles and interviews and just google it, it uh, there's even transcripts at marxist.org where Karl Marx says free trade is uh, you know, going to lead to the proletariat revolution or some gobbledygook like this um, so Servando gets into how the CFR conspirators are above the State Department you know they're above the CIA okay and so the CIA is kind of this sort of private army right so that's a lot of these people recruited out of the Air Force and, and lawyers and people like this recruited into the CIA to help coordinate to be the worker bees and the busybody soldier covert operatives on the ground the secret teams that work on behalf of their banker paymasters and the banker paymaster people are really strictly speaking these people at the CFR or above okay so the inquiry is what leads to the creation of the CFR and it's this rule by experts principle that Quigley talked about and who is Quigley writing about the CFR exactly Quigley is the historian the archivist of the CFR writing for CFR people, for CIA people. And what do we get with, uh, well, I like that, uh, you know, Servando goes back and talks about Cecil Rhodes. That's that's where we need to go back to, to understanding the background of this, because that's the model for the roundtable groups. The roundtable groups will be the model for the CFR and the uh, Royal Institute for International Affairs, Oxford, and so forth. Interestingly, he says, House... Mandel House and his Wall Street masters feared the European monarchs. Now, what have I been saying? Oh, yes, you see, I've been telling you <laughs> this. Quite contrary to the general libertarian narrative of freedom and liberty and all this gobbledygook that you've been told, the plot of the bankers was to get rid of the monarchs. And part of the way that you get rid of the monarchs is not just Freemasonry, uh, it's free trade. Mm -hmm. you see house and his wall street masters wanted to get rid of the european monarchs he says why because monarchs and national nation and nation states were an obstacle to global domination consequently they wanted to, people to believe that world war had been imposed on the people of europe by these corrupt monarchs and their aristocrats no world war was not foisted upon the world uh, through aristocrats and monarchs it was foisted upon the world by the bankers the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson and the Federal Reserve Act 
the House Wilson plan. This was all another step. Okay, I don't believe that, you know, as Chris has pointed out, they weren't secretly passing this on Christmas night or something uh, because otherwise they would have been caught. No, they were already in control, but they like to phase these things in, you see. So, the military industrial educational complex is where you get the recruitment of these these uh, controllers, so to speak, this, the shadow government types. So, who, who the shadow government types uh, are not Marina Abramovich, okay? It's not Jay-Z. It's academics. It's, it's Ewan Cameron. It's Jolyon West. It's Richard Haas. It's Zbigniew Brzezinski. Okay, these, these are the people who are running things in the U.S. Uh, and they're not always Zionist. But Brzezinski is not a pro-Zionist. Uh, he's very much a high-level CFR or above person, and he's not a Zionist. And you can read <clears throat> the Israeli press constantly being angry at Zbigniew Brzezinski. So uh, I'm sorry for all of the obsessives out there who obsess on Zionism. This is above Zionism. The Israeli state is only a recent creation. So how could this all be Zionism? Right? I mean, what does Mackinder say in the Mackinder Doctrine? He says that the establishment of the state of Israel is a geopolitical outpost for the Atlanticist establishment. So there you go. So what Servando argues is that the presidents have handlers. And that the handlers groom and recruit these people to become president. And this makes sense, right? When you read his, you know, his basically outline of how it works to groom the people who are going to be the front man presidents, the CFR process of recruitment. And when you read how it's done, you know, talent spotting and, and coming to them and college or whatever, giving them a road scholarship and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's no better example than, than Bill Clinton, right? And uh, Carol Quigley spotted, spotted Bill to be in this role. Uh, and it was the Rockefellers and all these people who were in the background of Bill coming to power. And then, of course, Hillary as well. And what's the model? Well, interestingly, I, I like that. And, and I've talked about this. John Adams has talked about this, too, over at Hoaxbusters, is that the background to even the inquiry it goes back even further into Rockefeller Pinkerton security. Private security, Rockefellers, the Rockefeller men who would come in and just sort of tell you what they would usually do is buy you off. They'd say, look, you're going to sell out your, your family business here. We're going to pay you good. Uh, and if you don't, we're going to mow you down. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was uh, pretty easy. It's a lot easier to, to buy people, you know, than it is otherwise. I think if you watch that movie, There Will Be Blood, uh, I think Jeremy Irons' character who plays this sort of Rockefeller character type guy, I think he even offers to buy the, the land, you know, with the oil or whatever, but it's been a long time since I watched that movie, so I may be wrong about that, but that, that's kind of what this that movie was hinting at, was this older model of this. Uh, I think that's even in uh, 310 to Yuma, right? It, isn't it, aren't, aren't they Pinkertons who come and try to take that uh, Christian Bale's home or something, or Russell, whoever's home it was, Russell Crowe's home, somebody's. So, this is how the Rockefeller spies work. They have fronts and shells, right? So having fronts and secret codes and ciphers and shell companies actually goes back to the modus operandi of uh, John D. Rockefeller. That's what he did. So, the spies' tricks and trades and codes and so forth, the tradecraft, it, it goes back to just the money power guy right the the billionaire oligarch guy right like a soros type and that's the role of uh, john d rockefeller and that's important because you know if you've got let's say you're running a big corporation if you watch wall street this same idea is is in wall street right because the michael douglas character when he finally uh, recruits or excuse me he, when he finally allows the Charlie Sheen character to work for him uh, you know Charlie Sheen's coming in thinking oh you know what you want me to do is to, uh, a bunch of objective analysis and you know watching the news or something like this and he's like no 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 
No, Charlie. What I want you to do is go buddy up to the you know the other traders. Uh, go out on the golf course with them. Go to the bathhouse with them. You know, go to the spa. Go to the whorehouse and and become BFFs with them and and find out what they're up to, right? So Charlie Sheen is kind of stunned if you remember Wall Street, the, you know, the Oliver Stone movie, because he 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 thinks he's you know being recruited to be a nerd or something, right? To do the to do to do nerd work. And what Michael Douglas tells him is that I don't need a fucking nerd. I need you to go and be a spy. And so, you know, Char Charlie Sheen starts dressing really dapper. And, you know, he's out there with uh, the babes. And he's he's getting the intel on what the other traders are doing. Stock traders and so forth. And that's more appropriate, right, as to, to what's going on here. And that's why sex operatives or, or swallow operations are a lot more common than we tend to think you know we tend to think that this kind of stuff is is relegated to you know sparse instances in history or something like that but no blackmail operations are a lot more prevalent and go on a lot more than you would think so that's you know a better method of growing your business according to john d rockefeller Now, so Servando has, another thing I like about this book is that he talks about Darwinism and how that's part of this, what he calls the tentacles of the octopus. Darwinism is, now what intelligence guy, <laughs> analysis, what intelligence guy's analysis out there talks about Darwinism? Hardly anybody. So, I mean, it's just phenomenal to see him talk about that. He also talks about how the Shah of Iran that this was a, also a Chase Bank operation, right? And uh, now Tim Kelly and I have talked about that. But the toppling of the Shaw, according to Jack Anderson, columnist, was that a graceful Shaw handsomely rewarded the Rockefellers by depositing huge sums of cash into Chase Manhattan Bank. And he also consigned the construction of a new housing to the Rockefeller firm. The next year, the Rockefeller boards were added again, orchestrating a coup in Guatemala. Uh, and that this was done by the United Fruit Company with their secret agents, the Dulles brothers, Alan and John Foster. They had also been board members of the United Fruit Company. So the Shah puts money into Chase Bank. There's the CIA Rockefeller group runs this coup in Guatemala. They then have the monopoly with this uh, United Fruit Company. And in 1964, one of the Rockefeller law firm's most important clients was M.A. Hanna Mining Company. Hanna Mining was a large producer of iron ore in Brazil. And soon after Joyo Goulart was elected president in 1961, he began to talk about nationalizing the Brazilian iron ore. Hanna's executives were then concerned, and so the CIA began to make plans for overthrowing Goulart. A psychological warfare op operation was approved by CFR agent Henry Kissinger during his chair of the committee of 40 and he sent u.s psyops disinfo teams to spread fabricated rumors concerning Guyart's communism Guyart, however was a nationalist who believed that brazil's resources belonged to the brazilian people and not to foreign interests by 1964 cfr agent john j mccloy one of the wise men according to uh what's his name according to malachi martin uh mccloy opened a channel of communication between the CIA and Jack Burford, one of the senior executives of Hanna Mining, and on February 1964, he traveled to Brazil. And on the night of March 31st, 1964, the CIA-backed military-led coup and overthrew Guyart. Similar accusations were made that a Rockefeller role was probably involved in the coup against Chile's Salvador Allende, who was actually a that this and this was actually here's one of the key points that we're going to get to about Castro a Castro CIA joint operation the fact that Henry Kissinger a well-known Rockefeller agent played a key role in overthrowing and killing President Allende points to a possible Rockefeller operation yes interesting and now that United Fruit Company thing is important because if you remember they come up in Godfather 2 and you remember me talking about Godfather with the uh, 
uh, Tim Kelly was one of the first interviews we did based on my article analyzing the Godfather films as you know showing how the world really works and note that I talked about blackmail sex blackmail in that as well so the mafia model right Epstein little St. James this is a lot more useful and prevalent than we tend to think and that's how the world really works so the next section Servando talks about the psyops of mainstream media and that's what I was saying earlier about how a lot of this CFR stuff really has to do with media because media mass mainstream media is really a gigantic arm of the CFR and is really just basically psyops right and so Servando talks about uh, Operation Mockingbird which we've talked about you can read the Woodward and Bernstein article that's really famous about this Frank Wisner is who, a CFR member was who's heading up this Mockingbird operation and this is over 400 journalists paid off editors run by the CIA we've talked about this many times and you know, it's you know it's it's even a joke that you can buy a journalist cheaper than you can buy a hooker so what does this mean well it means that the CFR is who was running FDR and FDR over the State Department in the CIA is basically a controlled operation and we are getting into this Cold War period with the CF, uh, the FDR with FDR and then with Truman this the CIA is the private army of the Fortune 500 that's the best way to understand it and that's how how what is this what is all this what's well, not James Bond it's the private army of the Fortune 500 that's the best way to understand the CIA the OSS uh, of the bankers by the bankers and for the bankers and so the next chapter we get into the history of MI6 age, uh, aiding and setting up um, the the OSS we've talked about that many times if you've listen to Jay's analysis I'm not going to bore you by repeating the stories of William Stevenson and Ian Fleming and Bill Donovan and on and on and on we already know this right uh, and the next section the Dawes plan World War II this is all you want to get deep into that you can go listen to uh, you know all the Quigley lectures that I did but you know MI6 is really in the background with a lot of these operations during World War II. Uh, and, you know, we, you can go to that interview I did with uh, Richard Spence, Dr. Richard Spence, about Rudolf Hess and MI6 and Crowley, and, you know, Crowley being an asset. And this is a bunch of lawyers, right? Frank Wisner, New York Stock Exchange, all these law firms. William Colby, Colby was an OSS officer, eventually became CIA, and he's out of Wall Street. Uh, Dulles's, right, all these people out of Wall Street. Sullivan and Cromwell, Wall Street, bankers, lawyers. Same, same, same story, over and over and over, right? Now, who trains and aids some of the Mossad? Well, none other than Reinhard Galen. <laughs> Sullivan and Cromwell, the Dulleses, in the background of uh, Reinhard Galen, the SS spymaster. What? Yes. Training Mossad. So you see, this is above Zionism level. It's above Nazism level. Uh, and if you look into Otto Skorzeny, and if you look into the Dulles brothers, and if you look into Reinhard Galen, then you will begin to understand that this is not a battle of uh, pure Anglo-Saxon or Teutonic Knights versus the evil Jews, okay? And if you read Servando's book, you'll understand that. Because the Zionist state doesn't even come into... Ex the, the same controllers were in power prior to the existence of the Zionist state. And if it had just been Jews, they could have created the Zionist state a long time ago, right? I mean, the Jews were who was running everything for centuries and centuries and centuries and the whole goal was to create the state of Israel they would have created the state of Israel 500 years ago or something right when whatever the plot is supposed to be but of course that's not how the world really works there's not just one group of people again Brzezinski does not like Zionism 
So how is he up at the top of this pier? Oh, you could say, well, he's just pretending. Not. No, he really doesn't like it. Right, and why is that? Well, because some people think there's other models to globalism that are not, that don't, don't care about Zionism or Israel. So, again, you have to take this into account in your analysis. You, you can't just adopt some sort of oversimplified approach to the world and say, oh, it's just all Jews. Well, why would Reinhard Galen and Otto Scorsini be aiding uh, Mossad people? That doesn't make any sense. Now, I liked also that there is a section in um, in uh, Servando's book where he talks about false flag recruitment. And this has happened many times. Uh, Mark Hackard's done articles at Espionage Hist History Archive on uh, false flag recruitment. Uh, this is talked about page uh, 101 uh, by by uh, Servando. Um, but, he, but he talks about acting in, in Hollywood in this section, this chapter. Page 102, 103. Cold War PsyOps, MGM Studios. Now you thought I was crazy for talking about this. No, no, no. I was right for talking about all this. And there's Servando talks about all this. So let's get into some of that in this next section. So if we want to talk about the Hollywood angle on all this, we needn't go very far. Other than, of course, the character, obviously, of George Clooney, who is a member of the CFR. And this shows my thesis in my book, I think pretty clearly, of somebody who is directly out of Hollywood tying into this network of invisible government operators secretly or super government I guess we should say to be technically correct and of course there are others as well right Angelina Jolie another one of these uh, Hollywood persons who because of their prominence because of their, their being you know raised up lifted up to this level of uh, media importance supposedly they're brought into and trained even by CIA handlers to take on these roles and if you think I'm making that up uh, you can just go find Melissa Mela and uh, Angelina Jolie talking about the CIA training Melissa Mela is a CIA operative who wrote Denial and Deception, a book that came out in, I don't know, 2004 or 5, and she details a lot of her CIA operations, and she is who worked with Angelina Jolie on the movie Salt, and you, you can find the DVD extras and promotional interviews where they discuss this, and so <clears throat> when Servando discusses the CIA in Hollywood, he's not, he's saying what I've been saying. And that's because it's academics, it's people out of law firms and advertising. And these Cold War spy stories, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place here in the book. Yeah, well, these Cold War spy stories, as we saw, a lot of those were hyped up by Hollywood, uh, according to Quigley. And Paramount and MGM, this is a lot of these people were part of the OSS and they, they just leave the OSS and go directly into movie making uh, and again it's a lot of these um, Hollywood types uh, 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 corporate types basically is what we're looking at and he says it's not a coincidence that William Donovan was recruited uh, from uh, by very wealthy family members excuse me by very wealthy families whose companies were supplying the Nazis Right, so the same families that are supplying the Nazis recruit Donovan to go train Mao's guerrillas. You see, that's what's key here, and that shows that it's supra governmental, it's supra ideological. It's not about Nazism versus Maoism, it's above that. He talks about the, the Vanderbilts, the DuPonts, you know, many, many of the names that we discussed in the Tragedy and Hope analysis, of course. So, he, he talks about KGB people being left in place. Quigley talked about that, right? Supposed KGB spies, Reds in the, the American government, left in place. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, now, I'm, I was looking for that uh, MGM Paramount section, but maybe I lost my place. Regardless, it's in it's in my book if you want to see where I talk about that in the Hitch, Hitchcock section. But he talks about giving Stalin, you know, the Eastern Europe uh, under FDR, and all these people think FDR was a communist when just like Quigley says they're missing the big picture that's the CFR that's in the background of FDR FDCFR <laughs> it would be a better way to put it and that's why as I pointed out uh, you have this scam over time where you, you'll get a period of national nationalism a period of privatization and then when that sucks and everybody gets mad Oh, you get the calls for socialism and spread the wealth and chicken in every pot, Herbert Hoover, right? And then it just FDR. Then it just back, your pendulum swings back and forth even over generations, and that this is even a long term banker scam, believe it or not. And now Quigley talks about that. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the wise men, I thought that was interesting to see him use that terminology, the brain trust. Uh, as they're called, these are the people in the CFR. Uh, I like also that Servando explodes this notion of the rogue CIA, right? You got all these good guys, and what we, this we've seen this from <laughs> recent people talking about, you know, the coup inside intelligence. There's not a rogue CIA. The CIA is the rogue government, and of course, their National Security Council, who is the CFR as well, above them. That's the rogue government. CFR agent Paul Volcker is who persuaded Nixon to go off the gold standard. And that's interesting. Now, this, the Bay of Pigs is supposed to be this big debacle. And this is supposedly where the public starts to think that the CIA is going to be involved in these foreign operations. Sorry, the CIA has been doing that for a long time. This is not something new with Bay of Pigs, as we saw back to Bogoto, Bogotazo riots in 48 with uh, Castro being the provocateur. But as I mentioned on another podcast, and I've already forgotten which one it was, maybe one of the, I don't know, some interview, I listed the many operations and interventions all the way back to 1890. Okay, so this I like this section Spanish-American War is what actually begins this American idea of interventionism. Uh, you know, getting entang foreign entanglements that the, the Founding Fathers was supposedly wanted us to keep out of. No, actually, we can go all the, go all the way back to the uh, Cuban-Spanish-American War and mark the beginning of American imperialism or Wall Street imperialism. These military inventions were on the behalf of the Mafia of Wall Street. Servando says, exactly. It seems as though the tough talk of the Chicago mobster closely resembles the guiding philosophy of Wall Street. You will get more with a kind word and a gun than with a kind word alone. That's uh, supposed to be from Al, Al Capone and Rumsfeld. So Rumsfeld is known to quote Al Capone, apparently, <laughs> to make that point. That's why I said go watch The Godfather 1, 2, and 3 and also watch Scarface. By the way, what's Scarface about? What Oliver Stone's telling us in that movie is that you have this story of Cuba and then these exiles leaving Cuba and the paramilitary, the, these people that supposedly fled Cuba, who are these supposed to be then paramilitary exiles from Cuba? Or who's recruited by the CIA and trained to go do this Bay of Pig things, Bay, Bay of Pigs thing, which is this supposed monumental failure. And interestingly, what does uh, Scarface learn when he gets to America to flee the Chivano on every corner in Cuba? Uh, well, he learns that the way you get ahead in America is to become a drug lord, <laughs> right? American Hustle. That's the point of the movie American Hustle, and it's uh, kind of true, isn't it? Uh, unless you believe the mythology of America, you learn that that's true. That you 
don't get ahead unless you're compromised. What has the WikiLeaks leaks shown us? Well, it's shown us that, right? So uh, let's look at a few of these operations that were engaged in foreign operations, covert ops, all the way back to 1890. This is crazy. You've been listening to the first half of my talk on CFR, CIA, Castro, Cuba, and all the other C's, right? <laughs> uh, my name is Jay Dyer. I run the site Jay's Analysis. Thank you for listening to this. My book is Esoteric Hollywood. You can find that at my website, jaysanalysis.com. If you click the tab for purchasing the book, you can get it directly from me. Just send me an email and we'll figure out whether it's better to do it through check or PayPal inside the U.S., outside the U.S. It gets a little pricey but it can still be done. These are signed copies of my book, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. If you like this podcast, you can subscribe at jaysanalysis.com for $4.95 a month or for $60 a year, and you'll get access to all my archives, interviews, talks, and lectures. Thank you for listening.